Hello, friends. I hope everybody changed the clock today. Um, the clock start changed. It's Ugh, our clock is wrong. Spring forward. It is so symbolic that today we celebrate the last day of a Slavic spring festival called Maslnitsa. It is celebrated in many families in Russia and all over the world. And here in the Midwest in Kansas City, we are celebrating it as well. Eleven. Let me introduce myself. My name is Elena and I'm a librarian with the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library. Welcome to the virtual Muslims celebration presented to you by the library and the Russian House of Kansas City. I'm delighted to introduce our presenters. Svetlana Yeager, the founder of the Russian House of Kansas City, Magda Born, adult services librarian at the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library, and members of the Russian House of Kansas City, Ruth Konakovich, Jeanne Landesheva, Snor, and Leila Rafik. I'm happy to say that I'm a member of this cultural association too. We are broadcasting live from Irina's Gourmet Bakery in Alesa, Kansas. Lana? The floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and uh, happy Maslinitsa to you all. Um, first of all, I would like to say that we are at the Irina's, Irina's Gourmet Bakery, Cafe and Bakery uh, of European Style Cafe and Bakery in Alaska, Kansas. And I have Yulia, Sasha, Lucia, Kola, <laughs> Oliver. Uh, with us, <laughs> they're hiding behind. So we have a small group of people and these are our little cute doggy. Yes, um, we are ready to start our presentation. And if uh, we, we prepared videos, some of us prepared videos. And if you find that the sound is quiet, make sure to turn up sounds on your computers, okay? On your phones or computers. And Lena? Lena, you're next. Oh, one, one moment, please. Do you see this beautiful picture of yeah. ladies and the children? Masha, Oliver, Lana, Sasha, Ruth, and Elena. By the way, these costumes were made at my home by these beautiful ladies. Uh, we made these costumes specifically for our first ever celebration in Kansas City, our first Maslinica celebration. So, this is a winter style costumes. And Ruth is wearing a, a costume of Sam. Sam is the main character of Master Ruta. So, and we are ready for Ruth, yes, Lena? Mm -hmm. Yes, you have controls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello. My name is Ruth Konikovich, and I am a member of the Russian House of Kansas City. I'm also a fourth generation immigrant. That means my great grandparents came from Poland, from Russia, and from Ukraine. And so today I'm going to speak to you a little bit about an Eastern European tradition called Maslanitsa. Maslanitsa is a spring festival, spring holiday that we celebrate for the return of the sun. Its origins are pagan, uh, and then it was adopted by the Orthodox Church. But masla means butter or oil, and the butter and oil is something that we use to make pancakes or blini. Now, blini are round, like most pancakes, and this has two significance. One is the sun. The sun is round, and it is warm, and it's coming to life. Um, and then the second significance is the cycle of life. So in spring, there are many cultures that celebrate the world coming to life again. We, you know, the, the old world of, of winter and cold and staying inside is dying. And we have the world coming to life. We have birds coming to life and we have animals coming out of hibernation, which is part of uh, one of the old words that they have for Maslanitsa, Maslanitsa, which is Komo Yelitsa. And I might have butchered that completely. So I will let um, Lana uh, let you know 
know about that, but the ancient Russian called bears calm, and the calm were masters of the forest. And so bears would be coming out of hibernation, and people would actually bring some meat to them as offerings. Um, so that's a wonderful little story that um, has to do with pancakes um, and the circle of life and waking up. The world's just waking up. Um, pancakes are something that are eaten all week long during the festival of Masarisa. They can be stuffed with jam, sour cream, with uh, caviar, with meat, so they can be sweet or savory. Definitely something that we eat all week long, and so we want a little bit of variety. Uh, Masarisa is similar to some of the festivals that we have here in the Western and the United States, um, but you'll find that the timing is a little different, and the reason for that is because Masarisa is, is the week before Lent, but in the Orthodox Church, we use the Julian calendar. The Gregorian calendar is what Easter uh, for the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church. That's the calendar that they use, but the Orthodox Church is still using the Julian calendar. And so there's usually a difference of about 13 days or two weeks between the days. And so that's why you'll see a difference in those in those dates. Russian Easter. Um, Russian uh, old years, New Year's. Uh, there's an old New Year's as well, but that's for another time. Um, so there's a certain reason why those uh, dates are different. Um, the celebration goes on all week. Um, each day is dedicated to something different for children. They, you know, we spend time bathing with children, spending with children. Mm -hmm. We also spend time visiting in-laws. We spend time uh, trying to to just shake off all of that winter, you know, especially after the winter we've had. I can definitely understand the celebration uh, that we're going to have with the last one this year, uh, especially in the Midwest. So um, visiting in-laws, um, the last day of last one, uh, and, and throughout this whole time, we're eating, we're eating pancakes, right? That's why it's called Pancake Week. Um, the very last day, there is a um, effigy. Uh, so a straw woman, usually dressed in clothes, and she is burned on the last day of Masamisa. And part of it does is to, it's a funeral for winter. Essentially, we're saying we're not going to we're not going to worry about winter anymore. We have to let it go. We're ready to let the spring come in. And so that's a very, I think it's a usual custom that we have, but um, in, you know, in, in other cultures as well. And then the final Sunday before Lent starts is Forgiveness Sunday. And so this is when folks will go around and ask forgiveness for something that they have done. Uh, and forgive each other and start anew. So spring is a wonderful time. It is a season that we definitely pay attention to, not just in olden times, but definitely now as well. So I hope that this has been useful to you. You've learned a little bit. And uh, go out and eat some money for Masa Mesa. Spend some time with your family and enjoy this wonderful time. Bye. <laughs> And we are demonstrating Blini, yeah? Blini. Look, they're round like some. Yeah. And Ruth was a very beautiful uh, on this video. She is beautiful and she was wonderful uh, in her uh, sun costume during our mastering celebrations uh, during previous years. So, and by the way, let me demonstrate something else, okay? Just a second because we are at Irina's Gourmet Bakery and we are ready for festivities. Irina prepared piroshki. We say piroshki, by the way. If you want to sound Russian, say piroshki, <laughs> not piroshki. 
the stress on the last syllable. <laughs> All right. So, Liana, so what, what is next, Liana? Next is the next slide. Okay. We have pictures of the girls that participated in the very first Muslim celebration in Kansas City. And I believe that was in 2017, way before the coronavirus broke. So as you see, these wonderful, colorful uh, costumes were handmade by all these wonderful girls. And Ruth, the one that you have just seen on, in the previous uh, video, uh, she represents the sun. She is a sun girl. You can see her uh, dress is white and uh, yellow with red. That's a symbol of uh, the sun, the yellow color. And uh, red color symbolizes life and beauty. In Russian language, red, krasny, means not only the color red, but also the word beautiful. So the red square is not just the square that has a red color. It means beautiful square. In fact, when it was built, it wasn't even red at all. It was white, white yeah. stone. Yes, it's true. And by the way, Sasha, here is Sasha. Hi. Yeah, one of our models. <laughs> uh, Oliver, he is behind the camera here. And that was me. So, Yulia was not, Yulia was not here, yes. Uh, Nicholas and Masha and Oliver, Yelena. Okay, let's go to our next slide. The next is the presentation by Svetlana. Okay, let me, so the sound may be a little bit quiet. Make sure you turn up your uh, sound on the computer and also, um, also just listen carefully. So that's it. <laughs> I'm ready. Hello, my name is Svetlana. I'm from I was born in the USSR at that time when religion was prohibited. Some sources on the internet say that Muslims was also prohibited to celebrate. I disagree with this. Because when I grew up, we we celebrated Muslims in a big event. We said bye to winter and welcome to spring, and we ate blini, played games, and sang songs during Muslim festival. Our country is a culture, culture. But in every republic, we had lots of people of the Russian. So Russian tradition was celebrated and popular in the Soviet Republic. This is why every Russian person in the USA, no matter where he is or she comes from, from which republic or country he comes from, knows about and you really love this tradition going and love to great I would like to describe how Martinus is great in Russia. Martinus contains both food and tradition. And is celebrated in the last Very rich and very bad. In Moscow alone, more than 500 men are planned and to celebrate the bloody folk holiday. Many 
sense as the bar, and stage. And from that, this one too, Russian. As I mentioned earlier, and as Ruth mentioned earlier, Sunday is the final day, day or night. When people so today's day of forgiving, uh, today's Sunday and final day of Masikas. The true door is the real time. And the open end. This practice has become an almost iconic symbol of the festival. And uh, also the end of Masikasa is the holiday about being outside and going a little bit wild. And of course, it will not be complete without having a parade. During festival to different cities of Russia, you will get people uh, in the Russian traditional costume and also in the costume of animals. For example, bear. Uh, and the bear is a very popular character in the market. Festivals include games, songs, dancing. Some of the games are a bit wild, and some of them even dangerous. And now I would like to describe some games and the uh, additions to Martin and Central. First of all, it's the uh, fist fight. Group fist fights are undertaken in the week of Martin. This sounds strange to Western, but it's all about the interesting, interesting events of Marching Fest. Peace fighters commemorate Russian history, where soldiers supposedly fought each other in hands against combat. But this peace fighting is just for fun. For fun during Marching Fest. A very popular during Muslim and all the time. In modern Muslim Israel, usually there are no real bears, but someone is dressed up like a bear, pretends to be a real bear, and entertain the public. In the past, bears and the tamer would perform at Muslim Israel, and both would be served large quantities of vodka. This ended in the wrestling match between Amen and Bear, with the Bear open in the upper hand. And of course, there are no real they bears on Moscow streets. Are bonfires and marching the door. Bonfires will be lit and strong door of marching the may be burned during activities in order to say farewell to winter. Sometimes a woman from the community will be chosen to dress uh, dress up as Maslitsa, and tradition says that this woman should be cheerfully thrown in a snowbank in order to complete the welcome of spring. Other traditions during a Maslitsa festival are troika rides, sledding, theater, puppets, singing, and fireworks. All of it is there is one part of the Maslinita celebration. Maslinita is a very old tradition, but it's still very, very popular and celebrated uh, by Russian speaking people all over the world. People arrange to see their friends and family, eat meals together, enjoy outdoor activities, and visit churches. At the Muslim Fair, you can experience the joyful atmosphere of the festival and the real taste of Russian culture. And of course, you can taste real Russian drinking, sour cream or caviar. And happy Muslim Fair! And this is one of the pictures, actually one of the uh, examples of our previous celebration. 
As you can see, we had uh, traditional blini, pirashki. We had uh, different souvenirs for sale. We had dancing. You can see the girl dancing, the sun girl. And two other representatives, Sasha and Yulia, that you can see yes. in the background. <laughs> and Sasha, <laughs> sisters, <Yeah>. Ruth, <laughs> Oliver. It's Arhan. Uh, you remember I mentioned that um, this holiday became multi, uh, participants are multinational because in the Soviet Union, Russian culture was uh, popular in every republic, no matter what republic you live. And for example, Orhan is from Azerbaijan, Ruth is from USA, we are from Russia, Jana is from Ukraine, and also she lived in Latvia. Nor, um, whose presentation you will see later, he's from Morocco and he's actually profit to make blini and you'll see how uh, well he does it. So, and Oliver of course was born here. So we have truly, truly multinational group of people and that mostly it was multi-ethnic and multinational. So. All right. Masli Sablini. As you see, Blini is a central piece of the Maslinitsa celebration. So everybody makes Blini uh, during Maslinitsa. And so did we. Uh, we shall see in the future slides how to make Blini and how to eat Blini. This is more pictures. These are more pictures of the blini. This is how they are made on the open skillet. Then you can hold them. You can uh, put different fillings in there. You can put meat, you can put uh, farmer's cheese. You can put apples, any kind of jams and jellies. And uh, there is a one very famous tradition to eat blini with caviar. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Which we've got here. Oh, you see. Red caviar. Yes. With a spoon. And we will demonstrate it to you later on. Okay, how we eat. Yes, how we eat <laughs> yes. and how we prepare. Okay, our next slide. Okay. So, uh, Leila and Noor Rafik and Jana Landesheva will show you how to make blini from scratch. All right, let's start the video. Mm -hmm. I want to grab the batter and <laughs> I think Tesla wants to help you too. It's okay. And Tesla is a little doggy. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Map of New Zealand. No, map of New Zealand. Papa capable. Those blins, first blin is usually made a like a messy blin. We even have an expression. First blin is a messy blin. Like miss everything place. else in the world. First time you do something, it does not work well. And so you have to learn and your skills. You can put different feelings with them. Fruits or caviar. <laughs> Red caviar, black caviar. <laughs> So let's see if it's a perfect one. Yay. And look at this thing. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, that's the crepe. Okay, what you need here, uh, this mixture is made with a cup of flour, two eggs, a cup, half cup of milk, and half a cup of water, two tablespoons of water, a little salt. 
We're ready to go. You collect everything. Put the blender. Oh, we'll the recipe later on. Perfect. Cream goes. I can't wait for my perfect crepe. Whenever you're ready. Why does it, it literally move? <laughs> oh my gosh, what is that? It moved. Why did it go to the other side? Oh, you can make those crepes any shape and look. Look at this. It's some kind of. What do you think kids look like? Marine animals. Yeah. <laughs> Designer crepe. Like that? Designer crepe. Oh, <laughs> and actually, you know, when we make our pancakes, we don't play as much. This is how perfect. <laughs> Crazy Usually stuff. we don't play, you know. Sometimes we do. Because it's serious business. Blini making, it's usually among Russians, is very serious business. But here is a little oh entertainment, especially for you all. Mm, perfect golden color coming up. Don't rush, don't rush, be in control. Put it down. Yeah. Go ahead, put it on the stove. You don't have to hold it in your hand. Yes. 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 All right. There we go. Can't wait to eat them. Now another one perfect coming up. The more time goes, um, <clears throat> when the pan is getting hot and uh, absorbs oh, the oil, you know what's the perfect. pancake is getting still, better and better and better. Each time we do new one. First one usually defective. Second yeah. is better. Third one even better. And so forth. And they're so fulfilling, especially in the cold winter weather when masses uh, takes place uh, in Russian tradition, people um, involved in uh, various early spring and the, the late, late winter, early spring. Usually it's still snowing and still cold and still freezing. People spend a lot of time. People spend them a much time outside, involved in various uh, sports, winter sports activities, um, and dancing, uh, singing, eating <laughs> pancakes and crepes, um, riding horses on the snow. In the slats, it's all kind of fun. As you see, you can have pancakes with various.
Lana next. Yes. Okay, just a second. I have to get rid of this, I guess, but- No, no, just next slide. I'm pushing, but it does not show me. Mm -mm. For some reason, it's stuck. So let me go back, maybe. No. Let me stop sharing for a second, okay? And let me see what's going on. Just, you know, technology is good when it works. Mm -hmm. So just a second. It was, by the way, it was beautiful celebration and Jana is here. Jana, can you be with us? Jana was a host of that video presentation. Just a second. And Jana, could you please share the recipe with us once again? How you made those blini? Jana, unmute. Unmute, Jana. Jana, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Here I am. Sorry, sorry. Forgot I'm unmute. Um, yes, that was pleasure making those crates. We'll, we'll be gladly, um, we'll be happy, happy share recipe with anybody who wants to. Um, and I was commenting on that video uh, that um, that's little American twist with uh, cookies, Oreo cookies for the love uh, for kids, maybe. So if you could utilize all kind of um, toppings for the uh, crepes and be as creative as, as you want. So that was pleasure making video for this program. And thank you so much for attending and inviting us. Great. Thank you, Jana. And now again, you see a beautiful group of uh, Russian speaking people and children, children, of course, included, you know, so just a second. Lena. Next, uh, we will talk about maslinica and caviar. Uh, you probably have heard that one of the traditional ways to eat uh, blini during Maslinsa or just blini uh, for Russian speakers is to have Maslinsa with caviar. And Magda Born will uh, show us uh, what caviar uh, is about and the history of caviar and why we eat caviar. Hello. And I'm here to tell you more about caviar, which fishes it comes from, the history of appreciation for uh, caviar, and the modern day uh, state of uh, farm fishing for caviar, because it is the, one of the most democratized foods in the world. Once available for only to the ultra rich because of the scarcity, is now being farmed all over the world with very good uh, quality and it's available to anyone who is interested in trying it. So caviar comes from sturgeon, which is very ancient fish. It was, uh, it, it was on earth 250 million years ago. So actually it was around in the time of dinosaurs. And if you look at, at a depiction of it, it, it's a very prehistoric looking fish. There are 27 different species of sturgeon. However, some of them are so similar, they could be only distinguished by laboratory DNA analysis. So what we refer to caviar are the black fish eggs, of egg rows from beluga, ocetra, and sebruga. Beluga is the most expensive kind, kind of difficult to find these days. And uh, uh, it, uh, it's, it's the largest of the fishes. It's almost uh, 30 feet uh, long, and it could weigh several tons if it reaches maturity, uh, which maturity happens uh, around the age of 20. So it takes many years before the fish is ready to produce eggs. A 60 pound uh, fish, uh, can have uh, 10 to 20 pounds eggs, eggs in it. Uh, originally, the fish had to be killed to extract the eggs. Now, German scientists uh, several decades ago came up with a process where the 
eggs can be extracted without actually killing the fish. So the fish can keep on living. If you purchase caviar, you uh, usually different, depending the different kind, the, the labels have different colors, especially the different kinds. So you can see if you are buying beluga or cedra or sevruga. So uh, the caviar has been appreciated for many years. In the sixth century, the Iranians already mentioned caviar in their writings. It's mentioned by Shakespeare. It's mentioned uh, in uh, 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 Gogol, mentioned a caviar feast in his stories. And Galileo Galilei sent a jar of uh, caviar to his uh, sister Maria Celeste to a monastery. But the sister superior uh, wanted to throw it away because it was strange looking and strange tasting jelly that she was not interested in. But uh, caviar uh, was uh, around in the time of Silk Road. They always tried to figure out how to transport it to those who appreciate it, but without the refrigeration. Uh, this food, which spoils fast, uh, was always challenged to keep uh, fresh. So it was always salted, but always heavily salted because uh, to, to withstand the transportation. Current caviar has only 3% salt. So the ones who really perfected the making of caviar were the, were the Cossacks uh, of Russian steppes. And it was originally peasant food for them because they ate it on butter, I mean, on bread instead of butter. And one day they offered, it is said they offered it to a Russian czar instead of the regular custom of salted bread, they offered him salted caviar. And he took liking to, to this uh, strange new food to him. And he gave Cossacks the, um, uh, 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 the exquisite rights for the fishing industry for caviar. However, they couldn't uh, export it to any foreign country. So this is how they, uh, for centuries, they were the ones really perfecting the caviar making. In the time of uh, uh, Soviets, they, uh, they, they, in a really smart way, they controlled the law of supply and demand of, for caviar. They limited the, uh, the amount uh, it, they processed to keep the prices high, yet not, not overfishing the, uh, the rivers. Uh, uh, so the caviar will not get depleted as it got totally ruined. And actually it had to, the protective rights uh, and export or imports were banned around the world for caviar in the 1990s because it was uh, uh, sturgeon was on the stream of extinction after the fall of Russia, it was kind of one for all game. Everybody was illegally poaching and fishing for caviar to make a quick buck. So that's why in the 90s, it was very difficult to get uh, caviar. So that's why other places stepped in. So as I said, there are 27 different species of sturgeon. So, so and sturgeon lives all in many rivers in northern hemisphere, in northern hemisphere only. So other countries uh, took the opportunity in farm raising uh, cavi uh, sturgeon for caviar. So now caviar from comes from Sri Lanka, Hawaii, Uruguay, uh, rivers in China, and. Uh, so, uh, so it could be very reasonably purchased uh, from all over the world. Uh, also, uh, sturgeon was, uh, as the fish was appreciated for centuries, it was the f most f f popular fish of kings in Western Europe. However, they didn't know what to do with caviar. They, I mean, with the uh, fish uh, raw, they didn't really appreciate it. And also the same in Americas, there, there, there was a sturgeon uh, plentiful at one time in America. And it is said the Americans threw the raw to the pigs. And once the Western Europeans who found out whose rivers were already depleted of sturgeon found out about it, they fled the, the, the Americas of uh, 
to, to fish for caviar at the time the canning industry was already invented so they were exporting cheap American caviar back to, uh, to Western and Eastern Europe. However, by 1900s, the sturgeon again, also in United States was depleted. But now one of the best uh, sturgeon for caviar is the uh, white sturgeon, which is available in the Western part or the, the Pacific part of United States. So there are many farms and uh, it's salted now 3% only, so it has a very mild, exquisite taste, and it could be purchased for a very reasonable price. Also, there is caviar made out of paddlefish at the Lake of the Ozarks, very near us, very reasonably priced, so you can taste it caviar as well. Stay clear or stir clear of uh, lumpfish, which is very cheap colored fish, and it doesn't taste anything like uh, real caviar. I should also mention that caviar is not supposed to be tasted with a regular silver or metal spoons because it alters the tastes. And if you buy mid-sized priced caviar, it always has these mother of the pearl spoons with it. This one is some sort of a, a horn, animal horn, which is also could be used. So one time caviar was the food of peasants later delicacy of the connoisseurs and now it's democratized for the mass market and available to all uh, middle classes so uh, i think all of us should uh, enjoy and uh, they uh, try to uh, this taste of a very unique food which is part of a celebration not only in russia but uh, major holidays around the world so enjoy your caviar and I got the audience question to research how it come about that the caviar is being served with blini. So actually it was an olden day kind of product placement because the one of the caviar houses, Petrosian, thought maybe they should come up with a suggestion for their customers and consumers how to serve caviar for people who didn't know how to eat it and how to appreciate it. Maybe they will buy more caviar if they knew how to serve it. So this is how uh, Lini and caviar came together. And actually from, from my Russian, uh, non-Jewish and Jewish friends, actually it has been served with Lini for many years. Also, I should mention the black caviar is a not kosher or halal food. There are many different uh, caviars nowadays coming from different fishes. They are yellow and green and orange. They come from salmon and different types of fishes. And those are, uh, should, they are kosher and they could be consumed according to uh, Jewish kosher laws because uh, the fishes, those fishes have fins. Sturgeon actually doesn't have any fins. So it is not a kosher fish to eat. Also mentioning caviar houses, a lot of uh, families got rich uh, in Russia uh, selling and exporting uh, caviar. And they, they were major art collectors. And one of them uh, actually uh, owned the painting of one of the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci. And, uh, and later these paintings ended up in St. Petersburg in the Hermitage or Hermitage Museum. So actually the Hermitage Museum got funded by a Russian caviar. It's kind of an interesting note to know. Thank you, Magda. Oh my God, it's great lecture. Amazing. Yes. And now uh, I have to stop sharing to make sure that I can go to another slide after YouTube videos that we created for you all. Um, it's a little bit difficult to change slide. Please um, bear with me and I apologize for these uh, moments. So, and uh, Lena, you can present our next scenery if you want to, what we're gonna do, okay? So while I'm getting uh, ready for the next. Next, uh, we have several oh, pictures. And I'm here to tell you. Uh -huh. Yes, sorry. Oh. So next uh, several slides will show you pictures of Masonisa celebration. 
Uh, some of them are traditional depiction, depictions of the Maslenitsa festivities in old Russia, and some uh, will be new one. And after that, we will proceed to showing you how to eat caviar with blini, or blini with caviar. Okay. So uh, this, oops. From the beginning. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just a second. Let me move to mm -hmm. our slides. Correct slide. Here it is. So wonderful picture of uh, caviar in traditional hochloma uh, dishes. With the traditional uh, Russian spoon, something like this. What you can see. <laughs> this is and a perfect that, size for eating caviar. Lena, yes. I have a smaller one, you know? <laughs> I'm a little better. humble. <laughs> Lena, do you want to share briefly what uh, this funny expression is? We eat caviar with spoons. What does it mean? Do you want to share it? Share it. <laughs> do you know what it means? No? Uh, yeah, when you, we say that uh, when we eat caviar with spoons, that means that there is abundance of caviar and we are so rich that we can afford to eat it with spoonfuls of caviar because usually it's just a little bit, you know, it's expensive. So a uh, little bit goes a long way. Yes. And when uh, when we invite somebody, maybe if, if jokingly, if somebody wants to eat caviar only, we say we don't eat caviar with spoons. So please like slow down on caviar. Yeah, just jokingly. Yes. So, and by the way, this uh, this picture was taken by me so for this presentation. Okay. And next slide. We can put we can put a, we can use crackers uh, with a little butter and caviar. But the most popular uh, butter broths or butter broths uh, are on white bread with butter and caviar. And caviar. Butter broth. You see jars here. So at that time, and this is our cute little doggy who was smelling caviar. And uh, we have a little presentation. Lena, do you want to continue? Uh -huh. This is one of the uh, pictures uh, that, the, that show you the Muslims the celebration in old Russia. As you can see, people were out and about. Uh, these are sleigh rides, I believe, not quite sleigh rides. Uh, uh, horses were uh, used everywhere, as you can see. No. It was one of the most favorite uh, pastimes for Russians during the Maslenitsa week. Uh, week. Uh, it was the week before Great Land starts, when you can have uh, any rich food, meat, butter uh, therefore people were rejoicing the whole week and eating up a lot of rich foods full of butter milk fat and I would, like, mm -hmm. and I would like to add that this uh, three horses uh, three is a holy number in many um, many religions so and in Russia of course God loves three we say and these three horses called Troika. It's very, very popular symbol of Russian winters, Troika horses. And of course, you can see, uh, this is a famous art, beautiful art by Kustodiev. Yes, Boris Kustodiev was depicting a lot of uh, scenes. Here's a celebration in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's another one. That's the tradition of burning Maslenitsa during effigy of Maslenitsa. Uh, this is how traditionally the celebrations would end. People would go outside, will uh, drag the figurine of a female figurine uh, dressed in female clothes. Uh, and then uh, people would burn it. And that would symbolize the end of winter uh, people get rid of winter and people celebrate uh, the coming of spring. And I would like to add, do you see this lady uh, uh, in the red and the, like black with reds, uh, red flowers skirt? This is uh, a, a replica or this 
these colors we used for our uh, castles and our castles are replica of traditional winter castles. And this is the modern day celebration and modern day burning of effigy of Masonista. As you see people, oops, oops. sorry. Okay. Uh, people try to uh, dress in traditional costumes, have uh, scarves, traditional uh, skirts and more traditional clothes you can see. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes. And um, let me see what is it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me go back. Okay. And now I am stop sharing, yes, because this is our final um, final presentation of today's festivity, virtual festivity. And it's going to be live presentation of Blini, Caviar, and Pirashki. And let me stop sharing my screen, okay? Just a second. I have to uh, turn away. Oliver, can you take it? So I have to turn my camera and we will present you our blini and how we put caviar and how, and how we eat actually with big spoons. <laughs> so let's just move that image. Um, if you go to a full screen, you can see better. Instead oh. of the list of participants, you can see the uh, screen of presentation. <laughs> We are here already. And uh, so we got blini, yeah, the round blini. I made them this morning. And usually during festivity, actually, there's big, big chunk, big piles of blini, like 50 in a row. This morning we just didn't have time. And I made like a so they meant to go to yeah, one dozen blini. So and Sasha's here, Sasha. Uh, yes, yeah, Sasha's <laughs> going to help me. So you see, we've got caviar here in a jar. Yes, I already prepared and put caviar in hachlama. You can see, and a little spoon, yeah? Make sure that everybody has a fair share of caviar. You see how fresh, how beautiful it is. <laughs> like, a, like a pearl, orange pearl, I would say. You see, like beads. Uh, can, can I tell you a brief story? Uh, my mother-in-law, who unfortunately passed away, she's an American lady, and my mama sent her a gift from Russia, a jar of caviar like this. And my mother-in-law, she did not know what food it is. And she said, what it is? I said, oh, it's caviar. It's very popular food. She said, oh, I don't know what it is. And I said, it's fish eggs. And she was not excited. She said, I'm sorry, but I don't think I can eat it. When she heard that fish egg. So we don't, in Russia, we don't use this expression fish egg. It's kind of turning off, you know. We say caviar, so, and it's very, it sounds very beautiful. So we grab blini, yeah? So, there was such a yeah. We put caviar in here. Let's see, like this. One spoon is enough, you know, one spoon is enough. Can do so, two. No, yeah, let's do two <laughs> for this specific being. Somebody special will have. Mm -hmm. So, and Sasha will. And I'll hold it and eat it. Yay. We, will, we were waiting for this for so long now. Yes. See, Sasha. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. See? Bon appetit. Mm. Mmm, Sasha, yeah. Sasha, tasty. So let me uh, let me make another a blin with caviar, and this is what I will do. Sasha folded this stuff uh, kind of like a French style, I would say. I'll do a little bit more Russian style. So I'll fold like this. Mm -hmm. This is. <laughs> this way everything stays inside it doesn't yes, go away yes. and uh, Lucia can I offer you bleach no, Lucia it's Sasha's mama she's going to be offering offered bleach can I, can I, can I, can I show you Lucia huh? 
Of them big and large, so or big and small. I'm sorry. Then we have a bread here. We can also use this bread with the caviar, butter, and caviar. I'm not going to demonstrate it because it is freshly made by Irina's gourmet bakery, Russian style of bread. So now you can see this is the most popular, probably, jar for Russian caviar. Lemon caviar. And you can see this is larger jar. And guess what is more expensive? Yeah, you can tell. This uh, jar is more expensive for sure. But we didn't order black one because it was a little too pricey. And it is usually, if, if you want to uh, bring a caviar from Russia in your, uh, in your suitcase uh, while you're traveling, um, you can bring red caviar but black caviar i think you cannot bring yeah. you cannot bring black caviar from even though if you buy for your own money but you cannot bring it so and also irina made for our table today wonderful russian piroshki uh, you see beautiful piroshki with potatoes with mushroom and potatoes Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And with cherry. So this is our see, we almost almost, ate almost it. <laughs> done this candle. Can you make one for you now? Yes. Oh thank you. <laughs> yes, we can make one for you now. And Yulia no, will I also will, demonstrate for us in, how in, delicious in how delicious this candle is and blini. And happy muslim it's to you all. Happy Maslinitsa. Yay. Happy last day of Maslinitsa. Yes. More we will not be eating, I guess. Be careful, but don't yeah, stay. Yeah, yeah. 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 mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Here is Yulichka. Yulichka. It is so delicious. I'm even afraid to touch it. <laughs> so it's okay. It's okay. We can afford. We've got even big spoons to eat. <laughs> yeah. Together. Well, it doesn't fit here. Even, you know, even though we say we eat with big spoons, but usually we don't because we know how, um, how, what kind of delicacy it is. So with this, Lena, I am going to return the screen to you. Well, thank you everybody for attending our tasting of caviar tasting for Maslinitsa celebration. I hope you found this. You found you found you found you. And uh, we hope that you will be able to enjoy, if not blini with caviar, but blini if you can make them yourself. It's, it's actually very easy. There are lots of different recipes. We gave you one of the simple ones today. Uh, you can find lots of recipes on uh, YouTube, how to make uh, blini and try. It's very, very interesting and very, very easy. So thank you very much again for joining us today. And uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of your week or weekend. Thank you very much Thank you. for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.